when we think about gender differences in earnings, then uh, there are kind of two possible channels. One is that uh, women have different kinds of jobs, but a lot of people have also argued that women differ in how they negotiate, not how they negotiate or how much money they get for the same job. Okay? And uh, one person I'm, I'm going to cite, one nice piece of evidence is actually Belinda Babcock uh, in her book with Sarah and Lasheva, they look at uh, MBAs from, uh, uh, from Carnegie Mellon and they ask people when they got jobs whether they didn't negotiate for the salary and they find that only 7% of women negotiated but 57% of men. Okay? And men also got higher salary than women. So if we uh, take this uh, to the extreme, then uh, you know there's a, a famous book that is called Lean In. So maybe what we should tell the women is to you know, negotiate. <laughs> and then maybe you're going to make more money as well. Okay? So somebody uh, in the fall this year took that advice very literally. Uh, there's this uh, woman who got a tenure track philosophy professorship uh, at uh, Nazareth College. She had an offer from them, and she wrote to them, you know, as I know, I'm very enthusiastic uh, about the possibility of coming to Nazareth, granting some of the following provisions would make my decision easier. An increase of my starting salary, uh, an official semester of maternity leave, a pre-tenure sabbatical at some point, no more than three new class preps. That's when you notice you're really happy to be an economist, uh, <laughs> apart from the money, I guess. Uh, and uh, a start date of academic year 2015, so I can complete my postdoc. Okay? So she ended the email saying that, I know that some of these might be easier to grant than others. Let me know what you think. Okay? And uh, the college uh, did let her know what, uh, what they thought. They said, well, uh, it was determined that uh, on the whole, these provisions indicate an interest in teaching at a research university and not at a college like ours that is both teaching and student-centered. Thus, the institution has decided to withdraw its offer of employment to you. <laughs> so it was pretty obvious what the university thought, and uh, they were clearly not happy uh, about this provision. Okay. I somehow I'm not able to use this. Okay. So if there, there might be many reasons why women don't ask or don't negotiate. Uh, one is that women are unable to negotiate. Okay? Like, you know, maybe this woman W was, was not so good in writing this email. Uh, it might be that women often have a cost of negotiation. Okay, so maybe they, they, they don't enjoy negotiating and so therefore uh, they are, they're not going to do it. This is a little bit of stuff that we have seen when we think about women and competition. Right? So we have seen that women might be less good at competing and they also may shy, shy away from competition even in cases where they're good at it. Okay? But of course there are other reasons why women may not negotiate. One is that they may have a lower outside option. Okay? We think about the uh, MBAs in Carnegie Mellon. Uh, if women are <laughs> more often married to a guy who is maybe uh, already having a job, then maybe the women have to take local jobs so they're going to have less outside options. But if the men have a spouse who is going to travel with them, then they might have many more outside options, which obviously makes it also more worthwhile to negotiate. There could also be discriminations. It could be that firms or managers or potential buyers of houses and so on are going to treat women differently. So uh, even though in principle you might be good at negotiating, it's actually harder to negotiate well uh, if the other side discriminates against you. And of course, a third option could be that there's a lot of backlash. You know, so there's some evidence in psychology that women who negotiate that are perceived as much more negatively. So maybe you negotiate a higher salary, but then nobody likes you and you're not going to get tenure. Okay. So there are lots of reasons why women may not ask. Not all of them may have to do with their ability to negotiate or the cost of negotiation when you look at field evidence. Should, should women ask? So what we're going to do is we're going to have an environment where we kind of want to eliminate a lot of those other reasons that we have seen. We want to eliminate the possibility of a backlash that we treat women who negotiate differently. We want to eliminate discrimination at least as much as possible. In our environment, everything is going to be anonymous. <clears throat> and we also want to eliminate the potential differences or awareness about outside options. So we're going to have an environment where, at least on those dimensions, we're going to equalize men and women as much as possible. But in our environment, what's still going to be the case is that there's going to be a sense of entitlement. So there's something you're going to negotiate over which you think should be yours. 
and uh, you know exactly what the outside option is. Okay, so there's no uncertainty on what is it that you bring to the table and what is going to happen if a negotiation fails. Furthermore, we're going to have an environment where participants can decide whether to enter negotiation or not, and it is going to be very, very explicit. And when we have a negotiation, it's going to be a real negotiation. So there's going to be a back and forth. I mean, they don't have to, but they can. They can make offers. They can make counter offers. Okay, so some, some people who have studied negotiations looked at the ultimatum game. I always thought the ultimatum is an opposite of a negotiation. So we're going to have a real, a real negotiation. So can and do women negotiate? If women who ask make positive profits, if that's the case, then first of all, we have some evidence that at least some women are able to negotiate. They're not all horrible at it. So if you're going to find this, and if you're also going to find that not all women ask. So those who ask, maybe they make money. Maybe we also find that a lot of women don't ask, and this is, this is the part that has been looked at uh, much more in the literature so far. If you're going to have both of these findings, then one maybe conclusion that people may jump to is to say that maybe we should recommend women to ask, okay? which is this lean-in uh, whole movement that, that, that exists now, uh, I guess not just in, in, in the US. But you know, the problem is, it's not obvious just from the fact that the women who negotiate make money, but not all of them enter. That does not necessarily mean that we should recommend everybody to enter. But there might be costs of leaning in, apart from just psychological costs of having to negotiate. It is very easy to make this recommendation. Uh, but in the lab, of course, we can look at what happens if we actually do force everybody to lean in and to negotiate. Okay? So we're going to have a treatment where women are not going to have a choice whether to ask or not, but they're going to have to negotiate. And we can see whether indeed that is going to improve the outcome of the women, at least materialistically. Right? Yeah. Don't we have the impression that women bargain more in the market for consumer goods than men? So if, well, it, it, there could also be, of course, differences in how much money you have or how much time you have but for negotiation. General, I think that the perception is that women are, are, are better bargaining for prices in the market and they do that more than men. Maybe because they, they are engaged more in, in, in shopping, etc. But it's kind of a contrast between bargaining in the market, which I think that yeah. you can't say that in the market women bargain less than men in the bargain more. And, 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 and this is for, for a job and salary is, is, is absent. Yes. So we, so therefore what we're going to have is we're going to have an environment where, sorry, you're going to see in a second, but in the environment, if, if I'm a, if I'm a, somebody who can decide to negotiate, I'm going to bring something to the table that is something that I produced, so to speak, and then I'm going to have to decide how much of this I'm going to get. So it's, so it's going to be really about, in that sense, we think of it maybe more like a wage. Okay? But it could be that, so I, it might be, well, first of all, let's see what we find. <laughs> we can think about what we should look at next. Um, but that people have also said it might be easier for women to negotiate for somebody else. Right? So maybe when I go to the market, I'm really negotiating for my family who shouldn't pay that much for the salad. But when it's about my salary, then it's, you know, so, so there, there was a little bit of evidence of that. So I'm not going to have much to say about this. Um, but on the other hand, from at least some evidence so far, a lot of people, I think, you know, if you think about summarizing the literature so far, it would be that women don't negotiate and therefore lose money. That seems to be kind of the <coughs> common wisdom looking at the psychology literature and the kind of very scanned economics literature, but, but not zero. I mean, here's one, you know, you have a paper uh, on negotiation. Okay, so we wanted to look at this a bit in more detail to understand exactly what's happening. Okay. So here's the experiment. We're going to have subjects can be either a firm or a worker. They are going to do sets of performances. There's going to be a round of performance, and then there's going to be five rounds of negotiation. The performance is going to be something you all have seen before. One performance is going to be adding up five two-digit numbers for five minutes. The other performance is going to be counting zeros in the tables of zeros and ones. Okay? 
So if I'm a subject, I'm going to have to perform. My performance is going to determine what we're going to call my productivity. How do we determine this productivity? For the worker, we're going to draw two other random workers. If my performance is in the bottom third, my productivity is going to be 10. If it's in the middle third, I'm going to get 15, and otherwise I'm going to get 20. And the firm's productivity is just, we're going to just compare the firm to one other firm. If your performance is lower, you're going to get a productivity of 20, and otherwise you're going to get a productivity of 25. Okay? So the worker's productivity is always lower or equal to the firm's productivity. But everybody's productivity is very much tied to what they have been doing in this task. Okay, so that's a, that sense we think of it as something that you're entitled to. That's, you're bringing this to the table. Okay? Everybody knows their own productivity. Everybody knows how these productivities are generated. You know, all of this common knowledge. In each of the next five rounds, we're going to do the following. We're going to randomly match a firm and a worker. We're going to produce a total pie. And that is going to be the firm contribution plus the worker contribution. That's the productivity that we just determined. Everybody knows what their own productivity. We're going to have two treatments, which are going to have no impact, so I'm not going to talk about them. Uh, but in one case, the worker knows about the firm contribution. In another case, the worker doesn't. It turns out not to matter. Okay? So the worker and the firm have a performance. That determines the productivity. We're going to match them. Then I have a joint surplus, which is the firm productivity plus the worker productivity. The firm is going to have to pay the worker out of the joint surplus. So the firm is going to get the firm productivity plus the worker productivity. And out of that joint surplus, it's going to have to give a wage to the worker. Okay. So how is this wage determined? Well, this just repeats that the firm is going to have to pay the worker out of that joint surplus. <coughs> how is this going to happen? So first, before any negotiation starts, we're going to randomly draw what we call a suggested wage. The suggested wage for the worker is whatever the contribution or the productivity of the worker was, plus a bonus. Okay. And that bonus is going to be random uniform, and it's going to be either minus 4, minus 2, 0, or 2. Okay, so in half the cases, the suggested wage for the worker is less than what the worker brought to the table. Okay. Sometimes it's exactly what the worker brought to the table. Sometimes we are more generous to the worker. But remember, the firm in general makes more money than the worker anyway because the firm productivity is higher. But this is going to allow us to think about how big do the costs have to be of entering negotiation? You know, when are you willing to enter negotiation, depending on how much you might get shortchanged, uh, given your contribution? Yes? Uh, do workers know the firm's uh, distribution? Or? They know that it's either 20 or 25. And how is it determined? In half the cases, they will actually know. In half, they won't. It turns out not to have any impact. Okay. Okay. So we have this suggested wage. Why do we need this? Well, when the firm and the worker negotiate, they have three minutes to agree on some negotiated outcome. If they agree on some wage for the worker, then that wage is implemented. That's it. What happens if they disagree? Well, if they disagree, we're going to say, well, first of all, everybody's going to pay a penalty of five. And second, what we're going to do is we're going to implement this suggested wage, and that is going to be the wage for the worker. So in that sense, the suggested wage is actually, think of this as the, that's the Nash bargaining solution, because this is, you know, this is the default option if we don't agree. Okay? And first of all, this agreement is also costly because both of us have to pay a penalty of five, which goes back to the experiment. Okay? So I'm going to walk you through an example, because it's a bit complicated. I think it's actually easier when you sit there in front of your screen and you have to do it, but uh, maybe uh, listening to it might be a bit, bit harder. Okay, so suppose the firm contributed 25 and the worker contributed 15. That was given by their performance. The worker was a middle good worker and the, the firm was actually a very good firm. So the total pie, the joint surplus is 25 plus 15. That has to be split between the firm and the worker. Suppose the bonus that we draw is minus 2, so the suggested wage to the worker is going to be 13. Everybody's going to see the bonus. And the worker now has a choice. Do I want to take that wage? 
or the one eight negotiation. If a worker takes this wage of 13, then the worker is going to get 13. And the firm is going to get the joint surplus minus the wage he has to pay to the worker. If the worker says, no, I don't want this suggested wage, let's have a negotiation, then they can negotiate. Suppose they agree on a wage of 14, which is still not exactly what the worker contributed, but you know, it's better than this, this 13. Then the worker is going to get 14, and the firm is going to get the joint surplus minus what it has to pay to the worker. If they don't agree, after three minutes are over, then the worker is going to get a suggested wage, but has to pay a penalty of five because they didn't agree. The firm is going to get the joint surplus, has to pay the wage to the worker, which was his initially suggested wage, and the firm also has to pay a penalty of five. Okay? So this is the setup. Everybody's informed that this is how the setup works. Uh, the one, one thing which I think is important is that the worker knows that this bonus that can be minus four, minus two, zero, two, is drawn independently of the worker. It is not something that you deserve. Okay? It just falls out of the sky. Okay. We have two rounds of five negotiation. So we have a performance, five rounds of negotiation, a new performance, which is new task, another five rounds of negotiation. We ran this at Stanford, which has uh, uh, two uh, drawbacks. One is we have to pay a lot of money. Second, we also don't have that many subjects. Okay, so the subject was a bit small. The other thing we do is we ask some risk of fairness questions at the end. I probably won't have time to talk about them, uh, but we, we measure the risk aversion and how they think about what a fair contribution is uh, for the worker. OK, so do women ask? So the main treatment, the first treatment is where they have a choice, the worker has a choice whether to enter negotiation or not. So the firm and worker, remember they are matched, they each have the contribution. Then uh, we're going to draw a bonus randomly from minus four, minus two, zero, and two. And everybody is going to learn about the worker wage, which is the worker's contribution plus the bonus. Then the worker has a choice. You can either say, yes, I'm going to take this, and then it's over. Or the worker can say, no, I want to negotiate, and then three minutes of negotiation start. Okay? We still care about this bonus, because if they disagree, that's the way it's implemented. Okay? Plus a penalty of five for everybody. So we have 41 women and 41 men. I'm actually going to focus on, uh, on the women. I'm actually not going to say anything about the men. But if you want to know, I can tell you something about the men. Okay. What are the gains from negotiation of these 41 women? The women who do enter negotiation, this is out of everybody, including those who don't enter negotiations. So we have some who make losses. Some of those losses are because they don't reach agreement. But the, the chances of reaching agreement are very high. Almost everybody reaches an agreement. Sometimes the worker negotiates and just negotiates back to the wage that was already suggested in the beginning. So they don't make any earnings from negotiation. And in many cases, if I enter negotiation, I'm actually making money as a worker. Okay? So in the vast majority of cases, conditioning entering a negotiation uh, the female workers, it's only the female workers, make money from entering a negotiation. Just to the worker. It was a zero sum game because whatever I gain, you have to pay me. Women play also as a firm. Yes. Sometimes as a firm, sometimes as a worker. I'm only going to tell you something about the workers, and then later I can tell you why uh, we actually, it turns out the firms are less interesting, and I can tell you why later. But here we just focus on the workers first. That's it. So here are the gains from negotiation for all the bonuses that we have. On average, the gains from negotiations are $1.45, which is significant. The gains from negotiation actually is significant for all the bonuses, apart from a bonus of two. That's when the worker is already getting more than a contribution, which on average, the returns to negotiation is, is zero. Here are the fraction of negotiations that end in a loss for the worker. Total is 13%. And, uh, you know, 
about 27% of the cases when the bonus was two, uh, did you have a loss. But, but you can see that in general, negotiations uh, result uh, in gains, not just on average, but even when you look at uh, the fraction of negotiations that end in gains, you know, that's actually uh, very high. You, you, you would imagine that indeed in this case it should be easier to get, yeah. yes. Um, so it, it turns out it's actually easy relatively even in the case of zero, but uh, this is of course only conditioning an entry negotiation. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you who actually, which women are entering negotiation or what fraction of women are entering neg negotiation in the case of minus four, minus two, zero, and two, where for all three of those, those who enter make money, here, they don't even lose it, no? They're just staying put. Okay? In the vast majority of cases, so they only lose in 27% of the cases. They either make money or they stay put. Okay, so actually, even there, the fraction of losses is not that high. But each worker in the room knows their productivity? Everybody knows the workers' productivity. And the worker in half the cases knows the firm productivity, but this turns out to have no impact. But the worker, I always know if, and we're only gonna talk about the workers today, as a worker, I always know what they bring to the table. Okay. So it's a very special situation. But the reason is, we're looking at this is because when we talk about women don't like to negotiate, well, there are many reasons behind this. One is I don't know what I'm worth, you know, I don't know what the outside option is. There's many reasons that have nothing to do with negotiation per se. So here we wanted to just focus on negotiation. We said, okay, you know, if you're gonna focus on negotiation, <laughs> let's focus on negotiation. And then we can think how much women shy away from negotiation or a bad at negotiation. Or, you know, you could imagine that some of these is more extreme because women might be also underconfident or, you know, lots of other things. So here everything is known. Yeah. So, so I understand that control that also happens from the point of view of the firm, right? So many yes. The firm knows exactly what the worker brings to the table. Yes. That's not the situation in this case. Absolutely. So we wanted to have something where really the only thing that is left over is I'm either good at negotiation or not. And uh, there might be some cost of negotiation. I might shy away from negotiation. Not because I'm underconfident about what I'm bringing to the table, but maybe I'm underconfident on how good I'm at negotiating. That we still have. Okay? But there's no uncertainty on what you bring to the table. Okay. And are these rules still, have they taken any, so are they instructed any way or have they taken any course on negotiation? Or negotiation or, or no, this is random Stanford undergraduate students. Okay. Okay. So recall, they make, first of all, almost in almost all the cases, they make gains or remain at uh, zero gains when they enter negotiation, and the average returns in negotiation are significantly positive, but they are zero for the bonus of two, okay? So let's look at how many women are entering in negotiation when we have each of those bonuses. A boni, but I guess, uh, you know. When the bonus is minus four, almost all the women enter negotiation, okay? When the bonus is two, less than 40% of the women enter negotiations, but the ones who enter here have a, a zero return on average, so maybe, maybe that's fine. You can see that as the bonus increases, the rate of negotiation decreases. Even in the cases where the average returns for those women who do enter negotiation are significantly positive, like here and here, a lot of women are shying away from negotiation. All the women, yes. And in regression, as you can control for that, and we have nice regression tables, which I don't have here. Yeah. And it turns out not to matter. It's a little bit, when you think about it, so on the one hand, you could imagine that women who are very good, so who are gonna be 20, um, they might also be better at negotiating. But of course, they have a harder time to negotiate because compared to the firm, they make relatively more money. But right? if I'm a woman who is really bad at adding up numbers, 
then I only contribute 10, so maybe the firm might take pity on me, <laughs> give me a bit more money because their contribution is always 20 or 25. And so that, that might have worked in opposite directions, maybe that's why we don't find anything, but we, we don't find a big impact of that. Okay. So in cases where women who enter the negotiation make a lot of money, a bonus of minus two and zero, we have quite a lot of women who don't enter negotiations. Okay? So um, all of those women, these are the women who don't enter negotiations. Of course, their return from negotiation is zero because they don't enter it. Right? So you could think of all of those women, all of those situations, you could say, you know, maybe you should enter, and then maybe a lot of this is going to move over here, and we would make them better off. So this is the, uh, in an environment where agents can decide better into negotiations, we found that those who ask make money. A lot of women don't ask, so maybe we should force them to ask. Okay, maybe we can bring some of that gray mass in, in this direction. Okay. So we have this lean-in treatment where uh, instead of just telling them they should ask, we're gonna tell them very forcefully, you know, it's like more like a, an advisor telling their student what to do, we basically force them to ask. Okay, so now you're gonna, we have a treatment where everything is gonna be like before, but now you have to negotiate. You don't have a choice anymore to accept this initial suggested wage. So, uh, everything is gonna be the same, the firm and the worker, you know, they're gonna get together, Everybody knows what the worker contribution is. There's going to be the suggested wage for the worker, which is the worker contribution plus the bonus. But now the worker has to negotiate. Okay? And again, the reason we care about this bonus is because in case of not reaching an agreement, this is going to get, what's, what's going to get implemented and everybody has to pay a penalty of five. Okay? So what do we get? Uh, we have, we had 41 women in the choice treatment, we have 31 in the forced negotiation treatment, uh, we started to run out of subjects. Uh, what do we get? Oops. So remember this is the, the figure I had before where these were all the women who did not enter negotiation, now in its different subjects, but if you think of the distribution, the question is going to be where, where is this big red blob going to go? And as it happens, where it goes is um, not to the gains, it mostly goes to the losses, okay? So we have some increase in the fraction of women who have a, a zero return to negotiation, but we have a large increase in the fraction of women who have negative returns to negotiation. Okay? This is not driven by women who fail to reach an agreement. They almost always reach an agreement. This is driven by women reaching an agreement where they make less money than a suggested wage. So uh, now this is just losses versus gains. There are no numbers behind it. The reason I showed it is because the numbers actually line up nicely. Uh, but at least, you know, as a first look, it looks like uh, this advice was not, not necessarily great advice for all these women who were <laughs> put at, uh, at zero because, you know, they, they are now making losses. So we can look at the gains from negotiation for any bonus when we force women to negotiate. And uh, when the bonus is minus four, the returns to negotiation are still significant and positive. When the bonus is minus two, that is still the case. The returns to negotiation are significant and positive. However, when the bonus is zero, now uh, the returns to negotiation is actually, as it happens, almost exactly zero. With a third of the negotiation, reaching in the worker losing money, a third gaining money, a third in no change. When the bonus is plus two, so when the suggested wage is to give the worker more than what they contributed, then uh, more than half the negotiation uh, and in an outcome that makes the, the worker worse off than the suggested wage. Yes. So in equilibrium, shouldn't you 
get the surplus that you contribute, I mean, that you get the value of your marginal product? How, how do we get up? Yes. I understand it's a one game with one firm, but yes. if it had a multi-game yes. going on, I don't know. Yes, so one way to think of it, think of a, of a the Nash bargaining solution, okay? The nice thing of our setup, what is the Nash bargaining solution when we start the negotiation? It's the suggested wage. Because if we don't reach anything, any agreement, we are both, we are, first of all, we're going to implement the suggested wage. And then if you're the firm and I'm the worker, we both pay a penalty of five. Okay, so that's, so you can think of this as the equilibrium is actually the suggested wage. And the penalty you can think of as the time I spend negotiating and maybe not working for you and you not having somebody else in between. Plus the bonus. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, that, is the, that, that is where that, that kind of a big part of the design is that there is no uncertainty about, that says, think of it, the outside option. Right? Oh, or the Nash bargaining solution if you want. It is the suggested wage, right? So the suggested wage is very important. And the other thing which I think is important is that, for, so you know it, and you also know that it's not something personal, okay? It's not that I say, oh, you, minus four, <laughs> him, two, okay? No, the so suggested wage is completely random. Wouldn't you be tempted to try another firm and draw again from the random distribution of, of the, the bonuses? I mean, you randomly draw minus four or minus two with this firm. Sure. That's not how we implemented it. So in our case, I yes. Look, I mean, it's an experiment. It's never the real one, <laughs> to some extent. Um, well, but you never have to need, uh, you need, uh, you know, overlapping firms, and everybody needs to have a job. So. Another way to think of it is that think of this bonus as, uh, as it happens, um, maybe, maybe you are particularly good for that firm or particularly bad for that firm because you know, it, it's a zero sum game uh, and uh, everybody knows about that. So it's, it's a very stark situation. Um, so is it about the sense of fairness? Right? Yes, very nice. Right? It's uh -huh. always half, yeah. mm -hmm. the game is half of the bonus. Mm -hmm. So we have six fairness questions at the end where we're going to present people with six scenarios. Uh, the scenario is basically uh, if you know, each of these contributions, each of these bonuses, and then you are going to look at a scenario and you decide how much the worker should get. And then we're going to take that scenario and we're going to pick a firm and a worker. If they happen to be that scenario, we're going to implement this. Okay? So uh, one scenario says, you know, the worker is a 20 worker, the firm is a 25 worker, the bonus is two, what should the wage for the worker be? You decide. And then we're going to pick a firm and a worker who had this constellation, and then we're going to say, okay, you actually decided how they should get, this is what they get, and then they can actually give you some money back because they like your, your suggestion or not. Okay, so we have a way to establishing what you think is a fair wage. I can show you what fairness is going to do to which women choose to decide to negotiate or not. But fairness might be something that could drive these differences. Another thing, by the way, might be risk aversion. Okay? We also have a measure of risk aversion. So is that the test that you're doing for fairness? Yeah. You, know, you do it after they've done the negotiation? Yeah. So I guess, so two, two questions. One is, do you get variation in the sense that... Yes. So it's not the fairness is half... Uh, half no. Fairness. Some people pay more attention to the bonus, okay. and some people pay less attention to the bonus. They just pay attention to what you contributed. Okay. That's where the variation is going to come in. And the fact that you find correlation between the measure of progress and what they do in negotiation couldn't be due to the fact that you know, the situation is very similar, I just don't it, so it's You don't know yet what correlation I get. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't shown it to you. I <laughs> I guess depending on the result, you might worry about that. Okay. That's why I, I think uh, it might be better to answer this question you know, depending on the result. Okay. No, yeah, it's good to worry, but uh, in some cases, the worry turns out to be not important because it actually was working against you, okay. so then it's fine. Okay. Huh? But uh, my, my late grandmother, you know, I told her, you just quickly worry a little bit and then. <laughs> so, 
Um, I don't like the implication. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, do women in the, in the first negotiation treatment earn less? So, yes, they have significantly low returns. And these low returns are mostly concentrated actually on the positive bonuses. Okay. So, uh, when you look at the gains I made, or the condition I enter negotiation, the gains that were made in the treatment where the women had a choice whether to enter negotiation compared to the treatment where they were forced to enter negotiations. For a bonus of minus four or minus two, these numbers are not very different. But when you look at a bonus of zero and two, uh, that's where there's a big difference in the returns in negotiation. <laughs> so on average, overall, if you look at the total returns in negotiation, going from the treatment where they had a choice, where they could self-select, to the ones where they were forced to enter the negotiation, reduced the gains for negotiation by 60 cents. For negative bonuses, for bonus of minus four and minus two, that reduction is 32 cents, which is not significantly different from zero. But for the positive bonuses, this reduction is a dollar, which is very significant. So it's for the zero and two bonuses where the women used to not enter to a large extent, if you force them to enter, they're going to lose money. Okay. So what's behind this? Uh, uh, you know, want, want me to, to think of the lean-in advice. Uh, that, that was really bad advice. Because uh, if we force you to enter negotiations, uh, you actually don't make money from this. If anything, you might lose money. Okay. Yeah. I guess I'm just wondering that to me it would be more natural, but of course it's a different case when you uh, would give advice on leaning in as a function of some information about how good that person is at. Mm -hmm. right? Because here you're just, you're just telling them to be a good person, right? So That's right. I think of this as a very indiscriminate um, advice. But I mean, another way to think of it is we just wanted to understand the women who didn't enter, why did they not enter? The only way, way I can find out of this is if, if I force them to enter. Right? So that's, that's what we're doing here. As it happens, it's also nice to talk about lean in because it's very popular. If you, if you want to have a reverse uh, way of thinking of this. Okay. So we have seen that when we go from the choice to negotiation treatment, where the, the women could self-select, not just depending on their gender, but also depending on the situation, to one where everybody was always forced to enter the negotiation, uh, then they lost money. This suggests that when the women had a choice of negotiation, they positively self-selected into negotiations where they were able to reach a positive outcome. Okay, so the first piece of evidence that in the treatment where the women had a choice that we actually had positive self-selection is because, well, if I have another group of women where I force them to negotiate, their returns look much worse. Okay. But we have a second piece of evidence that we might have a selection story, and this is, uh, you know, we're going to look at this a bit more directly. Is it going to be the case that we're going to have some women who are better negotiators and if you are not a good negotiator, are those the women who are then not entering the negotiations that are particularly difficult, namely when the bonus is either zero or two? So the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at your returns to negotiation when the bonus was minus four. And then we're going to check whether if you, compared to other women, had higher returns to negotiation at minus four, were you then more likely to enter these negotiations? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes? So these are, I think of these negotiations as tough in the sense that you cannot break an objective fairness criteria. But if you think about the first position, the risk of losing minus five, I mean, these women are in the position of power. Well, bo both, both parties are going to lose five mm -hmm. if you don't reach an agreement. Not, not just, yes. if you're the firm, I, I'm also going to lose five. So I don't know who has in more power than the other person. Now, it is true that I chose to enter the negotiation. Okay. That might be a signal. Okay. We can actually use the men and check what happens for them between these two treatments. 
Because you might worry that if I force people to enter negotiations, everybody's getting treated differently. So you can use the man's as control, and, and it turns out that doesn't have a big impact per se on the outcomes of negotiation. So I said I won't say much about the man, but the man actually has great control. So you might worry that one treatment is just so different because now we know everybody had to enter. Okay? But it turns out nothing happens for the man. Okay. Or nothing in this direction. Okay. So when you say that women have to negotiate yes. in the of experiments, does it mean that they have to call for treatment? No. You, you, the only thing it means is that you cannot just say, I want that wage and it's over. The three minutes start, but the way you can negotiate is there are, there's a box where you can chat, mm -hmm. and then there's another box where you just type in a wage. Or you, in that box, the firm could also type in a wage and you could accept it. Okay? So if you don't want to say anything, you don't have to say anything. A lot of our people don't say anything, but a lot of people say something. Mostly they say hi, you know. Sometimes just just say bridge. How you just say fifteen. Just And you can answer your own one. You can say whatever you want. Okay. You can revise your opinion as often as you want. Okay. Thanks. You're not allowed to say I'm a woman or a man. You're not allowed to say I sit in on the third, third row. So you're not allowed to identify yourself. Mm -hmm. Everything else is, is you can do. Okay, okay so we're gonna ask that how much money did I make? when the bonus was minus four? And is it the case that the women who made more money when the bonus was minus four were also more likely to enter when the bonus was zero and two in the choice to negotiate treatment? And that's exactly what we find. The higher my return to negotiation when the bonus was minus four, the more likely I am to enter negotiation when the bonus is zero and two. We can also look at this. Because sometimes the bonus is minus four, minus two, we can have a weighted average between minus four and minus two, and then the result is exactly the same. So that suggests directly just looking at the choice of negotiation treatment that we had positive selection. The people who were good negotiators, these were the ones, the women who were good negotiators, these were the ones who also entered the bonuses where it was actually tough of zero and two. And the worse of a negotiator I am, when it's really easy to negotiate, the less likely I am to enter the negotiations when they're really, really tough. So we have two measures of selection. One is looking across treatments, and the other is looking at within a treatment where the women had a choice to negotiate. They both tell the same story. Okay? So we can check now whether other regions of selection might have an impact, like what my level of risk aversion is, or what my fairness measure is, where we have these scenarios. And it turns out that, uh, ah, so I said this here. Another thing that might have an impact is how risk averse I am, or what my, uh, what my fairness is, where the fairness is, the way we measure fairness, as I said, is we, we have these scenarios where you decide, like as a dictator, uh, what the weight should be. Uh, and uh, we can check whether these uh, traits also have an impact on which women are entering negotiations of zero and two, and it turns out that it, it doesn't matter. Okay? This is not what's driving which women are entering negotiations. It's also not driving which are the good negotiators, as it happens. Okay. Okay. So every, I mean, you know, every theorist, risk is the first thing they think about, uh, but that turns out, again, to actually not be a driving factor uh, in, in our choice of negotiation. Okay. So what do we have? Uh, we have an environment where workers, they know the value of their contribution. There's no uncertainty. I know what I'm bringing to the table. Uh, there is a wage offer, which is a function of my contribution, and it's, I know what it is. It's, it's coming from the computer. There's no value judgment. It's not that the firm decides, oh, you look like you're not as good, so I'm going to give you a lower bonus. I mean, everybody knows that this is coming from the computer. When given a choice, we found that women who enter negotiations have positive returns, but enter only at a low rate, which, you know, there are quite some studies where they kind of have to finish here because they cannot look at, the, uh, at the, uh, what would happen if you would force people. So you might give this naive advice or this very hasty conclusion that you say, you know, maybe women should enter negotiation. But, you know, of course, we can look at the counterfactual 
And when we force women to negotiate, we found that the returns in negotiations are lower, and they are basically positive only for, uh, for low bonuses. So the, the, the advice was at best useless, but actually it was really harmful because the additional returns that we get from forcing women to always negotiate are actually uh, overwhelmingly negative. Okay? So what do we have? We have women who negotiate well enter negotiations, women who would lose money from negotiation, opt out of the negotiation. That is, we have no evidence that women shy away from negotiation when they shouldn't. And when we compare them to men in the forced negotiation treatment, it turns out that women, when they're forced to negotiate, look a lot like men when they're forced to negotiate. That's also why for the firms, nothing interesting happens. Okay? So what that means is that negotiation is not like competition. It's not that women shy away from negotiation. Uh, some women are not good at negotiating, but the ones who are not good know it, don't enter negotiations. Uh, and on average, male, male and female negotiators in this stark environment look very much the same. Okay. So one possible future research that kind of came up is that here we, strip, we made the environment very stark. Okay. Everybody knows what they're bringing to the table. There is no uncertainty about what my value is. I don't have to form beliefs about how much the firm should value me. Uh, maybe, when there is some uncertainty, maybe in this case, it might be that women shy away from negotiation, and then maybe we should tell them to lean in, but then it's not about negotiation, it might be more about, I am not confident enough in my abilities, or in, you know, what I'm contributing to the firm, or what I should be worth, what my outside option is. Okay, so an environment where none of this is an issue, uh, we found that, Women kind of know how good they are, uh, and when they stay out of the negotiation, they're doing it for the right reasons, not because of some psychological costs of, of not uh, wanting to negotiate. Okay. So, Julian, you saw us this nice graph with the women, so mm -hmm. depending on the minus four. Yes. Do you have the graph with what happens with men? Mm -hmm. So, the men are always a great control because. Uh, you might worry that there's something funny also about the way we design it, that it's just dropped for funny reasons. The men also drop, but much less so than the women. Okay. Uh, well, it's, it's flatter, but it's especially higher. Okay. Yeah. So some women may not enter negotiations because they just really dislike asking for sex. Mm. They're very mm -hmm. comfortable in the situation. Yes. So when you force them to do this, they will make a token effort. Right? They will just write one message and then somebody else will say something. Okay. So it's just not worth, the gain of you know, $5 is not worth the uncomfortable Yes. So it turns out, this analysis where I look at how much money you make when the return is minus four, and you are in such a situation, I, mean, I can also look at it minus four and minus two. Almost everybody has seen one minus four or one minus two. It turns out the better you are in this negotiation, the more likely you are to enter the negotiation when, it's, when the bonus is zero and two. Okay? So here, for minus four, almost everybody enters. Okay? And if you're good at it, it turns out you're basically always entering more. Now, we do have one woman who never enters a negotiation. Okay? That's why she's not in this table here, because I, I just have no clue how good she's at negotiating, because she just never, never chose it. But we have only one such woman. This is just the return from negotiation when the bonus was minus four. Okay? So I look at you at minus four, and I look at her at minus four, and her, and then I can say, okay, if you are very good at minus four, it turns out you have a higher chance of entering at zero and two than she does if she's less good. So it's not a, that, that's just how good you are. I have no clue how much you like it or not. I mean, maybe if you dislike it, you are awful. I don't know. But if you're good at it, if you can do it, if you have a high return, you are much more likely to enter the negotiation when the bonus is zero and two. Okay. I didn't hear if you mentioned it. Are there differences from the gender from the firm side? No, because also the, when we force everybody to enter negotiation, you can look at the men versus the women, because then there's no selection on either side. That turns out to be no gender differences in negotiation. 
That's why for the firms, nothing interesting happens because the firms never have a selection. And actually, the men and women just look the same when there's no selection on average. Mm-hmm. A woman who has, uh, brings 10, 10 euros, yeah. and the firm at least brings, brings double, and, and so the total stake is, is 30. 30 right? mm-hmm. So um, do you see something in the chat, like in the communication, what they talk about, whether they talk about the employer's stake or whether they need to talk about the bonus? Yeah, so we looked at uh, what they talk about, so they, you know, fairness is something that enters a lot, or, you know, I think I'm so poor, you should give me more money. And, uh, but fairness is a, is a big burden. It turns out that mostly the, there's no big gender difference in what they say. Um, the one thing that, so entitlement, so feeling that you know, I should get so much, uh, that's sometimes kind of a little bit negative. So you don't want to do that too much. Um, but not, the reason a bonus is important is that if we fail to reach an agreement, the outside option is determined by my contribution plus the bonus. Right? That's why the bonus matters. Okay. So in the, obviously in the choice of negotiation treatment it matters because the worker can just take it. <laughs> but even in the one, the first one, if we don't reach an agreement, that is gonna be the wage that is implemented. Right? It's the bonus. So I think of, if you think of Nash bargaining, that is the Nash bargaining solution. It is the contribution plus the bonus. Mm-hmm. It could be that if you're forced to enter that because it backfires yeah. so much, that the, the, yes. the effect would be much worse. Yes. Did you look at that? And no. So we, we just started with this. Uh-huh. Um, we, uh, so, so it turns out the problem is you need, you, need, you need a lot of subjects because you obviously need also the firms. And then we have the male people that we have, I mean, we have them in the paper, even if I didn't tell you about it. So for each woman worker that we have, we need three other people to come to the lab. So we, everything I have, I just told you about. I think it would be very interesting to try to understand this a little bit more. So what happens with discrimination, or maybe I've heard it, you will discriminate, so I just take it, right? So there, there could be a lot of interesting stuff happening. The other thing might be, you know, this whole issue of, what if I don't know what I'm bringing to the table? Right. I, I honestly, I think the results again might be a little bit different. But then it's not just about negotiation. <laughs> it's about, I don't know what I'm worth and confidence. So there's a lot of other things that are lumped in with negotiation. And lots of people say, ha, you know, women shy away from negotiation. <laughs> like, well, you know, if you get rid of all this other stuff, we just don't have any evidence of this. They shy away from negotiation, yes, but they should. Right? They do it when they should. So that's why we, we wanted to get rid of all this other stuff. Okay, thank you. Okay.